Welcome to Agile Roots 2010. Sponsored by Version 1, Rally Software, Vireo, Emirsis, Agile Alliance, and Xmission Internet. Before we begin, who here is a developer? Okay, who's here? Who's a tester here? Or fills in as a tester role? Um, product managers? Okay, UI guys? None. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Not surprised. Um, more or less, you know, this makes up the, the makeup of a team. You have stakeholders, you have um, design people, you have testers, and there's other roles, but more or less, this is kind of the makeup of a team. And uh, Cucumber, well, acceptance testing, I think, in general, offers um, offers a way to address challenges faced by teams, um, challenges that are joint and also specific to a, a, a specific role. The first is requirements. Now, Jeff Penton um, brought up one of these, brought this report in his keynote, and that was with the chaos report, right? But, um, this is an older report, but 56% 50, of all bugs are introduced in requirements. And the flip side of that is also that 45% of functionality is never used. And so all that effort you did put into, into the software, it's, it's never used. It's like the, the weight set you buy and put in your home and you never really use it, right? <laughs> It's, um, and when you do use it, you only use about 20% of it. Now, I totally admit that um, you know, Pat, 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 or, um, Jeff kind of alluded to this in his, his talk, that this report and its findings might be somewhat dubious, but I think it, um, the reason I bring it up is I think everyone who's been involved in software can relate to this. I think everyone who's been on a team has seen feature devotion within their, their projects. Um, the idea that we get so wrapped up in creating feature after feature, we forget the actual outcome that we actually want, and that's to make our users happy. So in Agile, we're very familiar with this card. It's a user story. And I won't go into the, the details of it, because this is an Agile Roots conference, and I'm, I'm guessing that everyone knows how you use these. What I'm going to say is how Cucumber picks up on this. You have a, a story like this, and to make this into a Cucumber feature, you take that card and you drop it into a plain text file. And you give it a name, and that's the beginning of your Cucumber feature. Now, um, Cucumber won't actually execute any of this part. This is purely for documentation reasons. Um, what Cucumber will automate is the acceptance criteria that follows this. And uh, the acceptance criteria I, I, I view as essentially the conversation that comes from the user story. Um, so you have this user story, and you have a conversation about it, and what you do with Cucumber then is you record that conversation. And you record that in a language called Gherkin. Uh, Gherkin is a, is a type of Cucumber, and it's a, it's a natural, um, somewhat artificially structured language to record requirements. It looks something like this. You have a scenario, um, you have a given some context, when some action, then some expected outcome. And the nice thing about these scenarios, I think, is that they're, they're just fairly sufficient for what you need to describe the, the uh, needed functionality. Um, in addition to these, you can also have conjunctions and disjunctions, and they all do the same thing under the hood. Um, what's really important is the, the words that follow those keywords. Um, so if we take a scenario from our previous user story about, you know, as inpatient buyer searching for stuff, we might get a scenario like this. And the thing I love about scenarios is you don't have to explain to someone what a scenario is. You just say, give me a scenario. And they'll give you more or less something along these lines. Um, and so you, could, you start with a scenario like this. You move on to another one where the context is different. Because the context is different, you have a different outcome. So this is kind of 101 uh, Gherkin language. Now there's some advanced stuff as well. Um, one thing that I think that Cucumber does really well is it encourages this workflow uh, mentality. Um, this is how designers think. This is how most people think when they think about software. Um, and fit, I mean, James, you can make, make can dispute this, but from what I understood was it wasn't really geared towards that. It was geared toward more towards the, the domain model. Is that, I mean, more or less the, the case? <coughs> uh, versus, versus workflow? Workflow. It had support for both, but it was better at doing domain level. Okay. So. And one of the things that did really well, though, is, is tables. 
And so we've taken that idea and also rolled it into Cucumber. And so there's a number of different kinds of tables. The first kind is a step table, where you essentially you want to be explicit upon, upon the data that a, a step gets, for example. So here we're providing, instead of just saying we have movies by Steven Spielberg, we're explicitly listing every data that's in the system at this time. And you can use these tables a number of ways. Um, with this example, I'm saying I should see this table on the UI, on the, on the GUI. And you know, to prevent frillness, you can actually constrain this so it only checks those cells and doesn't you know, blow up if more cells are actually added. Um, the other kind of um, table addresses the issue where you have a, you have a certain scenario and you have um, essentially variables that you want to change. You know, what happens if you type in Steve, or what if you type in Bird, what will happen? To address that, we have scenario outlines, where you um, replace those, uh, those strings with these variables. And so what it does is it loops over each one of these rows in the table and executes that scenario. And from the programmer standpoint, you don't have to do anything different um, as long as you write these original steps, then it, it works under the hood. Um, another notion is the background. Oftentimes, you'll have scenarios that have the same context. And to get around that duplication, you can promote that up into a background clause. In general, you want to keep these to be context and not any action-specific <laughs> steps. Um, the one final thing, kind of a side note, is you can also do multi-line steps. So in the case of like an email, for example, you want to make sure it's being personalized exactly. You can easily do that um, with um, multi-line steps. And we're using like the, the Python doc string type notation there. Um, and also, as a side note, um, since it is uh, supposed to be for um, customers, these features can be written in over like 30 different languages. Um, so there's no really, there's no bottleneck there as far as communication. So congratulations, you're all now Gherkin certified. Um, <laughs> and I'll be selling these for $500 after the conference. <laughs> <laughs> um, Pat will probably sign them too for you. Um, so what now? I mean, what is that? Doesn't really give you much, right? So I'd like to explain now the process that I've used um, with my with teams of using Cucumber. Now this isn't a hypothesized utopian world. This is actually what I've done. Um, I start out with a user story. We are using Pivotal Tracker um, to, to store our, our, our backlog. And so we pull a, a story off the stack and we take it to the whiteboard. And, and that usually involves a designer and the, uh, myself and the product owner. And we talk about what those requirements are. I then typically um, transcribe that conversation to Gherkin. And then I go back. And this is, going back is probably the most important part, because I say, this is why I understood was the requirements, am I right? And more often than not, I'm, I'm wrong. And more often than not, I've included functionality that, don't, that doesn't need to exist. And so this back and forth is really example. And that's also where the scenario outlines are really helpful. Because you can just go line by line in the by example in each row and get a lot of mileage. After that, I, we begin the outside in development process, as we call it, with Cucumber. And so now I'm going to um, stop there and go into how do you really automate this Gherkin. You have these plain text files, but how do you make them run? And it, um, first off, every project with Cucumber has a features directory. In that feature directory <coughs> are the plain text feature files, also with the support directory. In the support directory, you have an environment file, which, which is akin to a test helper. It bootstraps your environment. There's everything you need to do to get that your application up and running to be tested. Then you have the step definitions. This is where the rubber meets the road, and you have to actually make those plain text um, lines executable. And they look, look so you have a step. A step definition would look like this. You'll see here we're using regular expressions. So we're essentially turning regular expressions into method invocation. And for the variables. You define them with regular expression capture groups, and those are then yielded to your method to be executable. Um, and now inside the step definition, you can use whatever you want, whether it's WebGraph, you're in the Ruby land, or WebDriver, Water, um, HTML unit, um, JUnit, anything. So, so Cucumber is not specific to any um, language or framework, because um, as you see, that, that this this is obviously in Ruby. But um, we can address, we can actually test a lot more applications 
Um, so I'm just curious, who here is a, a Java developer? Okay, we have a few. Okay, um, C sharp. Okay, wow. Um, I, I slide in most of my my talk to Java. I probably could have done the opposite. The same. Uh, it's the same. Um, <laughs> so there, there's a number of ways you can use Cucumber to test applications. Now, if you're using something like Selenium or Water, you could obviously uh, apply that to any application. Likewise, there's some um, libraries for testing swing applications in Ruby. So that, that's one way. Um, the other way is to use the, what's called Cucumber's Wire Protocol. And we actually have that for .NET, and that allows you to write your step definitions in .NET. Um, and what do you mean in .NET? In C Sharp. Oh. Sorry. I hope it doesn't really offend anyone. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, did use, I did use C Sharp uh, back in like 1.0. Um, apparently, at Lambda's now, I found out. That's, that's yes. pretty cool. Um, yeah, so, uh, so this is how you do it. Now, this uses the wire protocol, which means it's sending over some JSON responses. I've never used it. My feeling is it might be a little um, not, not as pleasant to work with as the, the native Ruby version when you're using Ruby code. So, to get around that, there's other tools. Do you know if it works with Iron Ruby? It does. It, it right. does, but um, I haven't heard great performance uh, reports oh, yeah. on that project. That's so Iron Ruby. Yeah. Ruby. So, um, so Gherkin, the language itself, is not tied to Cucumber. We have this parser written in Rago, which is, we define this as a finite state machine. It compiles down to a number of languages, and because of that, um, Certain frameworks, specifically SpecFlow, have picked up on that, and this is a, uh, a VDD framework written in C Sharp that uses the Gherkin language. So if you know Gherkin, you can just pick up this, this uh, tool, and it will integrate nicely in Visual Studio. And uh, it, it, I imagine it's probably a very nice uh, experience as far as um, de debugging and that sort of stuff goes. Um, kind of the third route is through Something like Iron Ruby, but JRuby. JRuby is actually very mature. I, it's the you know it's tagged to being the fastest Ruby um, implementation currently, um, if you exclude the the one line versions. So it's very fast, and because of that, you can use it to test any um, host language on the JVM. I'm currently doing a closure project, and it's actually working quite well with it. And to give you an idea, this is how you would translate those, those Ruby steps into the various um, languages. So it's more or less the same thing. It's you know your keywords and regular expressions. Java, you have to use annotations. Um, Why did the Java server boast? <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> it's not that bad. Yeah. I mean, there's only one more line, right? Um, <laughs> but I mean, I'm double talk, the lines. On a serious note, I mean, if you are doing, unless you're really invested in Java, using something like Ruby or Ruby, I mean, the integration is so tightly within Java. There's not a whole a lot of benefit of having your, your, your acceptance testing compiled, I think. Um, so you might be thinking, this is a lot more work for me. Right? I have to now write these step definitions instead of just getting down to work. Um, that's true, but there is some overhead, I won't lie. But I think that overhead is paid dividends. And going back to my the talk about requirements, um, I will often take a, a story like this and show my, um, you know, my business state an analyst or whatever and say, does this look okay? And they'll say, no, you don't need to do this, you don't need to do this. And so off the bat, you save a lot of time not worrying about edge cases or functionality that doesn't really need to exist. And so you're only focused on writing the software that matters. Additionally, you also know where to begin and where to end. When that cucumber turns green, you're done. Likewise, when it turns red, you broke something, and you have to fix it. So it provides a safety net. Um, and kind of going back to this you know, whole theme of this conference of building great uh, software, you know, it turns out that thinking about software from a user's point of view turns out to be a good thing. And as developers, at least speaking for myself, it's, it's really easy for me to think they get lost in the code and the, the inner workings and forget about the user experience. But when I'm focused on um, writing requirements in English at the higher level, how they're actually going to interact with it, I, found, I find I produce much better software. And so to produce the software, we use something called the outside-in process. Now, traditionally, um, programmers will, will often start with like a database schema initially, work up to the models, 
go up to controllers, view if you're doing like a GUI or, or web app, and eventually you'll do the UX. Well, outside in flips this around and goes from the very outside and works inward. And so the, the feel of how this works is you start out, well actually, I'll back up a bit. I like to describe this um, outside in process as kind of bike gear. You have two gears, the outer gear being cucumber. Because you start with a scenario, and when you first run that scenario, what will happen is um, the steps will be pending. So Cucumber will tell you, you need to write step definitions. And when you do that, Cucumber will go red and say, OK, you're failing. You need to go write the code to make this pass. But instead of doing that, instead of just making the code, you actually go down in here and do your traditional PDD cycle with your X unit. Um, and the reason why you do that is Cucumber, if you're, if you're operating on doing end-to-end -end tests with Cucumber, um, you're going to get zero design benefit. In fact, you'll actually hurt your design if all you do is end-to-end -end testing. So you really need to fine-tune um, the, the innards with traditional PDD, red, green, refactor. But once you're done with that and you're green on that level, you can actually take it up and see where you're at. And typically, you're at another pending um, step. And so then you repeat that process until you're green all around. And you refactor and you repeat. So that's the kind of typical process. Um, so I have an example of this, and these slides are taken from um, Azak uh, Helisoy's slides, who, who was the creator of Cucumber. And I saw these slides from him because he has some Java examples. Because I, for some reason, I thought that everyone in the room was going to be a Java programmer. Um, I could skip them if you'd like, uh, but yeah, it, it's probably it's still probably good to give you an idea of how it would work. So you start with a feature. This is a, a feature for the Mastermind. Um, game, and also should point out when you're using uh, Java or any compiled language, the step definitions can't live in the features directory; they have to live in the test directory. Um, now, typically, when you're installing Cucumber, you would just say Gemisoft Cucumber, but in Java land, you'll probably want to use Maven, or if you're using Ant, you can do that as well. Um, but Maven, I use Maven, and it's it's pretty easy. You do some XML pushups and you're, you're there. Um, it uses Tigo container for um, the um, dependency injection. You can also use Juice or Spring if you're already using those. Um, and what happens is when you first run, it hooks into the integration test task. When you run it the first time, you set the property to install gems true. That will automatically install JRuby, Jet, uh, Cucumber, and all the dependencies you need to run. And it will run it, and you'll see something like this. A um, couple of things to point out is the on the far right you'll see that we have a stack trace. We know exactly where the um, these steps are lining up to for this feature. And so what it, what it's saying is you need to go write these features. But it actually does more than that. It doesn't say you just need to write them. It actually writes them for you. It doesn't write everything, but actually it gives you some pending step definitions. And so if you're not too friendly with regular expressions, you'll be okay to get started because it fills in the gaps. So you copy and paste these into your step definitions, your, your step file, and when you run it, you're not told that the steps are pending. You have to implement the step. So you go down, and well, if you look at the, if you look here, there's a location. So you go to that location, and you, you write the step. Now again, this is a regular expression being yielded to this function, the secret code is function. So to write it, we, just, we say oh, what our intention is, we're going to create this new game object. So of course, when you run that, it will have a comp compilation error. So you, you create the game object, and at that point, that step is green, and you move on to the yellow step. And you keep doing this process until you're green all around for that particular scenario. At that point, you add more scenarios, which will then break, but then you keep going this process until you have this entire feature delivered. Now, um, since they're all jerking certified, you should see the problem with these scenarios is that they're doing the exact same thing. Um, the only thing different is the, the names of the, the variables. And so you can extract that out into something like this. So if you have a little, a little more tricks about Cucumber, um, that is that is tags. I think tags are really one of the best features of Cucumber. I think every testing program could have them. Um, here, here are some examples of how you might use them. We've tagged this feature as, as using Lucene. We're saying that we need this dependency to be there for this feature. 
Additionally, we're tagging them on a workflow basis. This scenario is a whip, it's a work in progress. This other one's proposed, meaning it's pending UI or whatever. And we can also tag long running ones as nightly ones. Because you don't need to run your acceptance tests all the time. If, if certain acceptance tests will give you enough confidence to deploy, then certain ones that are um, long running, you can kind of delay those executions until nighttime. And so you can tag things like that in any arbitrary way that you see fit. And then to use it, you can say, you know, don't run everything but the ones tagged. Or you could say, run everything with the ones tags. And one thing about the whip is Cucumber kind of promotes the Kanban workflow mentality. And so you can limit the number of scenarios in progress um, or in flow. And you can also say, if this does pass, then blow up. Because this is a work in progress and I'm expecting failure and not success. And that, so the whip pro, the, that whip tag is actually helpful on CI builds, so you can prevent um, false, um, false positives. Some other things you should be aware about is hooks. You can hook, up, you can hook into the um, cycle of Cucumber before a scenario, after a scenario. Um, the world is really to provide helper methods. Now the hooks, since the, day, since the customers can't see them, they're really best to put in um, Something like a database, like if you're truncating a database, that's what you want to put in these hooks. Something really low level, not something that provides context for a feature. And you can also do tagging, tag hooks. So if, there's, um, if you're using Selenium or something, and you only want to use Selenium on a few features, you could tag it Selenium, and you could then use a hook to switch out the driver for um, your, your whatever you're using to drive the browser. So, one thing I want to touch on really quickly is, is the notion that acceptance tests have to be end-to-end -end tests. Now, the way I've been talking, I've certainly given that impression, and the way Cucumber is mostly used is with them being end-to-end. -end. That being said, I don't do that um, 90, I don't do that all the time. Um, and there's, I like thinking of this with a scale. On one side, you have a slow to fast, and the other side, you have isolated to integrated. Now, when you're writing these tests, and actually when you're even writing step definitions, you can um, pick what level you want to operate on. For example, when you're filling in the context steps, you can just stuff things into the database. Those are going to be on the code level. You don't have to go through UI to put data in. Likewise, there's some other intermediate levels before you go full blown and do the water or whatever. You can use stuff like um, headless browsers, like HTML unit or V8 driven um, tools that will actually you know, manipulate the DOM, but aren't quite as heavy. And so what I typically do is I'll write one scenario that's happy path that goes through the entire stack, but then I'll have a whole series of edge cases that will just hit my domain models. Because I know that it's all wired up and hooked, hooked up correctly, there's no reason to incur the additional cost of having every single edge case going through um, the whole stack. Um, so I bring this back to testers. Um, because developers, at least in my mind, should be in the, the testing process intimately. So what do the testers do at this point? Well, they do what is really important, and we'll often get to go and that's exploratory testing. Um, and oftentimes, so when, when on path projects, we would always hand off to people to do you know, exploratory testing, and they would always find things I missed. And that gets just fed back into the cycle, add a new scenario, and then you know, I would address that. And then we keep doing that until we're done. And we're, we have the feature that we needed. And hopefully, because we thought about the user experience from the beginning, we'll get a ha happy outcome instead, in addition to just output. Um, the, one, the other benefit I see of using a tool like Cucumber is you avoid this, this problem of dead documentation. Um, dead documentation, I found, is not only um, not useful, but it can also be harmful. And so instead of dead documentation, you have living documentation. You have executable documentation that you know describes how the system is actually working. <coughs> and really the notion of it being executable ensures that as the system evolves, um, this documentation will evolve as well. And so to me, that's a really a, a key benefit of, of Cucumber. Um, a few subtleties I'd like to point out. Um, when you're writing scenarios, it's very easy to, it's more of an art than you, than you would think. For example, um, we have this scenario that I, I listed above. Now this, work, this, this is very high level, it's very declarative. 
I have these movies, when I search for this, I should see these movies. Now, you could rewrite the same scenario in a very imperative style, meaning the intention of, the, of how the implementation is supposed to be is, is supposed to be is in line with that scenario. Um, and there are certain trade-offs to these styles. Um, I've worked with certain, certain designers that really like this. They like being able to say, when I click here, I see this. Because otherwise, they don't really know how the UI is going to pan out. But there's some, there's some, so there, there's some trade-offs because what you've done is you've shifted all the maintenance to the plain text stories. Where before, with the declarative approach, you will be writing more declarative step definitions, but when you're writing that code, you'll be on the, the code level and you can have all these abstractions to reduce duplication. When you're on the plain text level, you're really um, setting yourself up for some, some pain in some cases. As an example of that, um, you take this login example. Uh, this login example in and of, of itself is fine because you're talking about lo logging in, and if you want to describe the process, that's fine. But if you add a new scenario, changing the process, and you simply copy and paste that, what you've done is you've really confused what this scenario is about. All of this above is incidental to what this main scenario of changing the password is about. And so what you can do with Cucumber is you can hide that noise and wrap those steps within another step. So the, the steps can actually call other steps within the step definitions. Um, so here are a few resources. Um, you, can, you can go, uh, Coops Info is the main page. And you can also, uh, on GitHub is where all the code is, especially the, um, the Coop for Nuke and Duke is off up there. Um, anyways, that's it. Uh, do you have any questions? I know I went through that really fast and wasn't, after the following path presentation, it wasn't uh, too uh, hard, hard to follow. <laughs> well, I, I'm, I'm just a little bit, uh, just a little bit not getting how you would take these, uh, these cucumber specs that you write uh, and test like a Cocoa app. I noticed you had like an iPhone app on there and that, that's really interesting to me. So like, I, I don't know, I, I, there's something I'm missing. How, do you, how does it go all the way from the back to the, to the front like that? So for, um, so as I said, Cucumber is really a thin wrapper and it relies on third-party libraries to drive those things. Um, there's actually a project called iCook. Okay. Which oh, will, okay. Um, what it does I, is, I think it installs some sort of driver within your iPhone application and you send it HTTP requests. Well, yeah, you have to worry about this. The library does that. But it essentially will drive it. And you can, if you search for iCook, there's actually a screencast showing you. Spell. So these so these drivers tell you what's going on in the Yeah. Um, I it's, so it's I uh, C U K E. I Q. Yeah. And really, I mean, those things, I, I think those are nice, but to a certain extent, they're somewhat of a novelty because um, you're, you're, for the web, web, the web is slightly different because you're developing your whole UI. There's a lot more ways you can screw up, unless you're using something like. Way, perhaps. Um, but with the iPhone, Coco is fairly set, it's set up, so you're not, it's, it's harder to mess up, essentially. And so I think those, stuff like iCook may be valuable for a couple scenarios, but I wouldn't go, I wouldn't do everything through sure. iCook, for sure. Yeah. Mac Ruby runs it as well. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Has anybody made the, what seems to be the obvious correlation between uh, Link as far as the, the uh, syntax is concerned. So, um, I never used uh, Link. I know what it does, but I mean, that's really for data. I mean, you're yeah, talking about. I mean, the focus is completely different, but as uh -huh. far as the syntax is concerned, it seems obviously the very common. Yeah, I, 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 I guess I don't know. I am Just, I mean, because you said you can write these in, in C sharp or whatever, it just seems obvious that it would be better to write it. Hmm. Well, uh, I mean, I, I don't know C Sharp at all or that community at all, so I've never thought about that. That's interesting. Do you know who is, runs that project, the C Sharp? Community? Yeah, so, well, if you go to Specflow, I think Specflow.org, yeah. or um, a guy named, by the name of Richard Lawrence runs the Coop for Nuke stuff. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know if anyone's really explored that at all. I know there is tie in for Specflow within Visual Studio, so maybe there's some sort of um, something happening there. I don't right. know. <laughs> Yeah. So I have a question on uh, 
when you should use it versus when you shouldn't. You talked a little bit about that. But uh, in a, a web application example, let's say uh, we have a, a bug, right? I, I, I click this form, um, and then I've seen Cucumber Specs where it says, you know, I fill out the form, I click go, and I should not see a 500 response in uh -huh. return. I mean, is that an appropriate use for, for this, or? <coughs> um, I mean, that, so especially talking about Rails, I mean, that's probably the best level to do it at, like the 500, that, to really make sure that we are seeing that. Um, I, I mean, I would say that it, you have to balance the maintenance costs of these tests with the value that you're going to get from them. Uh, there's, there's certain times where, you know, adding a certain test on yield level just makes a lot more sense and it's a lot cheaper to do. So it really, it's really value, it's really context uh, specific. I just, uh, what, what you don't, what you shouldn't do is use Cucumber 100% of the time. That, that's just <coughs> right. Um, you really do need the, the lower level uh, examples. Um, I don't know if that really, that probably doesn't answer It's one of those hard questions in software. I'm, I'm looking, for, I'm looking for you to can. say you should not test response codes in Cucumber. Well, so I do test response code, so I can't ah, do that. Curses. <laughs> I, well, so, but I mean, you can do, like, I should, I should see a su successful response or something. Um, mm -hmm. But, so I'm actually, right now I'm doing a, so I'm, the project I'm working on now is a web service, and um, we've decided to use Cucumber to, to test that. Um, it's, in, it's in Clojure, but we're still using Ruby and Cucumber to drive it. And we do certainly test response codes because as a, as a consumer of that web service, you really care about whether or not that, um, that code is correct or not. And the other thing, I really like how the, um, the metaphor of starting with the story and going all the way down through your test-driven development, coming all the way back up and, and kind of cycling up and down, I think that's really helped me understand uh, you know, where this fits. And I think it's, it's terrific. Yeah, I've, really, I've worked with the, like, some really smart, um, I'm going to call them hackers, that don't really subscribe to many processes, but when you send them down to write one of these things, they really like, like the, kind of the, the, the mood it puts them in, not the mood, but the, the mindset. Because yeah. like, when you sit down and have to write something in English and articulate something, it really changes how you think about things. And, and it kind of just, mm -hmm. yeah. Can you talk again, I kind of missed out on why, why you're saying you don't use it for testing and web, like response codes. And he was saying that. I was saying that. Why? He was saying, go ahead. Why? It's like, I don't know, he, you start testing for edge cases in it, and it's it, it's slow and it's level overhead, and I think those well, are better tested somewhere else. Well, well so one argument is, level level. you typically want to keep, for, for normal scenarios, a user using a web page doesn't care they got 200 response. I mean, that's really incidental, and so you shouldn't be saying, you know, when I search for this movie, I should get a 200 response, and I should see this. By virtue that you're seeing the movies you're getting, kind of infers you're getting at 200. And so you, you, the idea is that you don't want to pollute a scenario with details that aren't really key on what it's trying to accomplish. Well, I guess it accomplish. depends on what scenario you're actually testing. Exactly. And that's why, the, and that's why he does. does. That's why yeah. And that's why the web service I'm, I'm doing is basically given this JSON, I should see this JSON, and I should get a you know, 402 or whatever. Sure. Because that is something that is relevant at that that high level of detail uh -huh. because it is part of the API. Right. Yeah. And there's actually yeah. been several uh, people, like so there's a company, for example, called Chargeify, and they have um, all of their Cucumber features are their documentation for their API. You go on to look at how to use their API and it says, given this, when, the, when I send this JSON or XML, I should see this response. And because it's executable, you're guaranteed that that's how the system works and the, the burden of updating documentation is then, you know, removed or mitigated. It's excellent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, any other questions? No? Okay. Thank you. Thank you.